Right. Shall we go back and have a look at Revelation? I hope that I've got a feeling there might be plenty of questions by the end. Get that off the screen. That's better. Moving on. The revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the proper title mm. for this book. And one thing I want to say to you, I want to encourage you all at least to use it more than you do do. When you talk about revelation, talk about the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because that's important. We so often focus on the terrible things that happen in this book. But actually tonight, as I work through it much quicker, I want to focus on the good things that happen in this book. There are only three references to the kingdom or kingship of God in the book of Revelation. Now, I'm not going to go through them now, but if you want to make a note, the first one is Revelation 1 verse 9. The next was it is in Revelation 11, 15. And the third one is in Revelation 12, 10. But the whole book is about the kingship of God. So while there's, I'm going to break with my tradition to try and get through things for the previous six studies, I've only focused on the passages where kingship is mentioned. In this study, I would do a disservice to Revelation if I did that. So what I want to do is take you through Revelation, looking at these three passages as we go, but also showing you how the theme of the kingship of heaven runs all the way through the book. And it really is its theme. So let's move on. Looking at the title again, because actually the full title is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Now, I think we often skip over this. At the end of the first century, God said to John, he gave him a vision and he says, it's important that you deliver this revelation of my son to these churches now. They needed to know it then. We think it's all about the last few years. But it was something that John was given to show the churches then. Because, and I've tried to see if there's any other meaning, but the word is actually shortly, things which must shortly take place. So God wanted to, these Christians to know about this at the end of the first century so that they were ready for something that was to begin happening soon. And he sent this message and authenticated it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Now, there's something important about that that you may not have picked up. Because if you go nearly to, the, well, to the last chapter of the book, as we've organised it, and in verses 6 and 7, John is told, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. So this book is sandwiched with a reminder that these words were sent by an angelic messenger to show his servants things that must soon begin to take place. And Jesus ends up by saying, behold, I am coming 
quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, two problems with that. 1900 years later, we think he's been a long time. He thinks it quickly. Right? <laughs> God isn't rushed. But can you see that the importance of this book is to get God's people ready? It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. So let's move on back to my little diagram because I'm going to nail my colours to the mast here. You can see I've taken out the um, width of the thing at the end. I believe, like you see there, the black line is Daniel 11 mapping out in advance for the Jews in Babylon what their next period of history was going to be like. And I, I believe the, revel the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ is mapping out to the church what their future history is going to be like. And it follows that line of decline and then things getting better. So let's look at it a bit more because, again, some of you may have heard me say this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. We, we've dealt with that. But what does that mean? Well, if we take that phrase and we look at the first long word, it means unveiling. So this book is about the unveiling of Jesus Christ. But if you look at the meaning of the word Jesus, it means saviour. So this book is about the unveiling of the saviour Christ. But we all know what the word Christ means. It means king. So this book is how the saviour king will be unveiled in this world. It's how the Lord saviour king will return to reign. And I don't believe it's there for us to try and piece all the things together um, I know some of you know Clifford Denton, and a while back he wrote an excellent article, or maybe a series of articles in Prophecy Today, about how he, the Hebrew view of prophecy, it's not there to help you work things out in advance, it's there so you recognise what's happening when it's happening. And to me, this book says to us, when you see these things happening, look up, because you're kings coming back. And it's all about, so the church knows, what will happen in the lead up to Christ coming to reign. And that thrills me an awful lot, because actually, in the last 18 months, that aspect of this book has begun to live a lot more to me. So let's look at the unveiling of the Saviour King in the first chapter. The introduction, I am not going through that in details, but in verse 7 we get this announcement. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will moan because of him. Even so, amen. So that tells us something about the return of Christ. It tells us that what the angel said when he left is true. That has the clouds took him up, so he'll come back. It tells us what Jesus said. And what others say, that every eye will see him. You won't need to go looking. Everybody will see him, even those who pierced him. And there'll be great sadness in every nation when he comes back. Why? Because men haven't humbled their hearts before him. To go back what we were saying earlier, they've leaned on their own understanding not upon God. And when he comes back, 
he will announce, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So right at the beginning, we have this majestic announcement of the return of the Saviour King. And that brings us to the first reference of the kingdom as that word here. And John says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingship and patience of the Saviour King was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm your brother, I'm your companion, and what do we share? We share tribulations, we share the kingship, and we share the patience of our Messiah. And so John saw his imprisonment as part of his king, the kingship of Jesus and he was there why not because he read the scripture so much but because he proclaimed that living word of God and with it the testimony of Jesus Christ and that was an offense to men so that's how his first reference to the kingship of the save is direct reference to the kingship of the savior king he carries on to say that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day or on properly better translated the Lordy day, the one day a year when every Roman citizen had to swear allegiance to Caesar by declaring that Caesar is Lord. And it fairly sure to assume that John would not declare, take that oath. Instead, he declared that Jesus was Lord. And he heard a voice behind him repeating, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And he tells John what he sees to write it in the book and to send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And I'm not going to read the list. And you'll be pleased to know that I'm going to skip over the two chapters that everybody stood in Revelation and not got past. <laughs> right? We're not going there, folks. There's nothing about the kingdom directly in it. But it's they are about how to prepare for the return of the king. If you're in a church like this and you want to be ready for his return, this is what you need to do. But I'm not going there. We're going straight on to chapter four. And after he'd been told to write to those seven churches and what to write to them he looked and he saw a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this and he says immediately I was in the spirit and what did he see the first thing a throne set in heaven and one sat on the, on the throne. And he who sat there was like Jasper and the saddest stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the th throne in appearance like an emerald. And he saw around the throne 24 more thrones. And on those thrones he saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. This is a kingly setting. We've got a throne. We've got someone important on the throne, surrounded in glory. And we've got 24 elders sitting with white robes and having crowns of gold on their head. This is a king's palace a king's courtroom 
And that's the picture that's built up in that chapter. And it goes on to describe the one who's in Daniel called the Ancient of Days. But then in chapter five, we meet another important character in this story. And it starts, and this is important, that in the right hand of the one he'd seen sat on the throne, there was a scroll written all over it and sealed with seven seals. And a strong angel shouted with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and lose its, and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And that caused John a great deal of upset because no one was found worthy to open that scroll and read it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Now, this majestic character on the throne wanted that scroll to be opened. And there was nobody found on the earth to do it. You know, that reminds me a bit what happened with Adam. When God said it's not good for man to be alone, he fetched all the animals to Adam. And he named them all, but none of them were up to the job of being his helping companion. And God created woman to go with him. And here, God looks round the whole of heaven and earth. And there is no one except the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. I really should have put them in light blue because those are kingly titles. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, was able to open this scroll. And what did he say when he looked in the midst of this courtroom? He saw a lamb that looked like it had been killed. But it had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the spirit, seven spirits of God, sent, of God sent out into the, all the earth. And he come and he was able to take the scroll onto the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now we read that when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, all began to worship him and say, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Now, how many times have you read that and not really let it impact you? We sing the, the chorus that goes with it. But here, this lamb who was slain has redeemed us to God by his blood from every people on the earth. And not only have he redeemed, has he redeemed us to God, he has made us kings and priests to serve our God. And he's promised that the day will come when we will reign with him on the earth. Now, the word kingdom is not in that passage. But that last paragraph declares the kingship of God and the kingship that we will inherit. And it, to me, it's thrilling. And if nothing else I want to say to you, 
This is what we're looking forward to as God's people. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from right around the world. We have been declared to be kings and priests to our God so that one day we will reign with him on this earth. We're moving on. And this is a little bit of a different theme here. It's a theme I could make much more of, but I just want to flag it up. It says now, in chapter 6, now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. So, who opened the seal? The Lamb. Why did he open it? Because it was his father's will. And throughout that chapter, you then begin to get things happening every time a seal is broken. And in verse, towards verse 12 onwards, you get to see this. I looked and he opened the seal and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of air and the moon became like blood and everything fell out of the sky. And it rolled away and every mountain and the island was moved out of its place. And what happens? And the kings of the earth, great men, rich, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hides us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? And this is the counter theme of this book of the unveiling of the Saviour King. Its main theme is that the King is coming back to reign with his saints. Its counter theme is that as that is beginning to happen, things must happen on the earth that will cause the kings of the earth and many great people to be dismayed and try and hide themselves in the mountains and the rocks. Now, at a time when many are fearful of what's happening around the world, and people are fearful of plots, I want to say, let's get those plots, those schemes in place, because they're not going to succeed. They're not going to get anywhere, because the king is coming back, and these very powerful people will find themselves hiding in caves and in gaps in the rocks of the mountains, they will be terrified. And our God will not let them succeed. And that's the counter theme to the theme of the king coming back. I want to move on to chapter 7, another little bite down to 7. I'm trying to give you an overview and pick up the bits that often get unamplified, right? And at this point, John says, that after these things, I looked, and you'll have to read it to see what was happening before, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. See, what they're doing, they're worshipping the Lamb, the Saviour King, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne, worshipping God, saying, Amen. I highlighted Amen, because they're saying Amen to what was being sung that salvation belongs to our God. 
who sits on the throne unto the Lamb. And then they said, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever. What a glorious scene. There's all these troubles being unleashed by the Lamb on the earth. And here we have these people praising God. And one of the elders asks him, who are these people in white robes? And John says, well, I don't know. You know. And he tells them who they are. He says, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And washed their robes and made white them white in the blood of the Lamb. They, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell amongst them. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing this is. This is the saints who've endured great tribulation. And through that, they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And they've endured and they've overcome. And he goes on to say they'll never hunger anymore nor thirst. They probably did a lot of that. They won't be beaten by the sun or any heat. And the Lamb will shepherd them and lead them to fountains of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is a victory song. This is something which is really worth looking forward to. I'm jumping a few chapters. 11 now. And again, look at, the, look at what we're told here. We give thanks. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty the one who is and who was and is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come on the time of the dead, that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy those who destroy the earth. So here we're at a point where the time has come for God to stand up and take his great power and to prove that he's in charge and to reward his servants who feared his name. And at this point, John sees the temple of God in heaven opened. And he could see the Ark of his Covenant in that temple, not the one that was on the earth, because that was only a copy of this one. This is the real one that he could see. And there were lightnings, noises, thundering, and an earthquake and great hail. It was a majestic moment. And that, sorry, it was a majestic moment. And that speaks of the Saviour King. In the next chapter, we discover that war breaks out in heaven. And My Michael, the archangel, and his angels fought with the dragon. <coughs> and the dragon and his angels fought back, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And at this point in chapter 12, the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And at that moment of time, John says he heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of Christ have come or the kingship of our God, and the power of Christ has come. Why? 
because the accuser of our brethren who accuse them day before God day and night has been cast down. And why was he cast down? Because they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. So this, Jesus said, when we pray, pray for the kingdom of God to come. Your kingdom come, your kingship come. And here we are told, this is the moment when that prayer is answered. And the consequence is that Satan loses his access to heaven. And how does he lose it? Because he was overcome by believers who trusted in the blood of the Lamb, who were not frightened to speak about his faithfulness to them, and they were not frightened to lose their lives because of him and this is a great moment in history and it's what we're looking forward to skip a bit further to chapter 14 verses 6 to 8 then i saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every tribe and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. That appears to be the everlasting gospel that we should preach that men should fear God and give glory to him for his time, the hour of his judgment has come and to tell them to worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water on it. Do you remember Jesus said that when that the Holy Spirit will convict men of sin and of righteousness and of judgment you see here we have it we have righteousness and judgment side by side but notice too what happens at this moment in time this is before we get to the later chapter another angel falls after him and declares Babylon is fallen is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So here we have a balance. And we have this counter thing coming in that I mentioned earlier. We have this declaring of the glory of God and of the future hopes, but at the same time, we have the kings of the earth being thrown into disarray. And I'm actually going to take you through the whole of chapter 15. It's not very long, but it's important because John here sees another sign in heaven. Great and marvellous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. And he says he saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Now, 
lots of people at the moment are talking about the mark of the beast and things like this. But what I get out of that section of this chapter is what we really ought to be talking about is wanting to be people who have the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, whatever it means. Because if we are people who have that victory, we will be standing on that sea of God, glass, given instruments that we might worship God with. And this is a wonderful thing. This speaks of deliverance from the beast, from his image, from his mark, and from the number of his name. And I wish we would encourage people to see this is a book. This revelation of the Saviour King is about overcoming these things, not fleeing before them. And what do we see again? John again sees into the temple that which is in heaven. And it's out of that temple, these seven angels with the seven plagues come. And they've got clothed in bright linen, but they have golden bands around the chest. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Let me stress again, all these judgments that are coming on the earth, where are they coming from? They're coming from God. They're coming out of his temple. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the will of God coming to completion. And we ought to be people who are saying, your will be done. Not panicking about it being done. <laughs> I say thank you, Lord, that over the last year and a half, you have thrown the leaders of this world into turmoil. I'm serious about that. I am very thankful. I want to move on to 16 briefly because this is the counter thing. Again, the fifth angel pulls out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom becomes full of darkness and they hate it and they blaspheme God because of the pain that results and they did not repent of their deeds. And when the sixth angel did a similar thing on the river Euphrates, it prepared the way for the kings of the earth to travel from the east. So maybe China does have a role in the future. But then he saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophets. And they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So here's the counter thing. Even though the kingdom of the beast is now full of darkness. And out of the mouth of this trilogy of characters comes demons to lead the kings of the earth by the nose. They are doing the will of God. I think I've mentioned it before. I don't know if it's here, but I do mention it quite often. There's that phrase, I think it's in Joel, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of de decision. 
And we so often think this is talking about God calling people to come and giving them an opportunity to repent. It isn't. If you read the context, God is gathering them there so that he may decide their fate. He may decide how they reap what they have sown. And that's what's happening in this chapter. God is gathering his enemies together and he is using the dragon, the beast and the false prophet to gather them. They will give them false hope. And we must not be terrified about it, but we need to pick up our Bibles and say, this is that. When we see it happening, this is that. God is going to gather them together. And this theme continues. Not just in this chapter, but the next two chapters, 17 and 18. You, you get this theme of God manipulating the kings of the earth. That he might bring justice upon them. So I'm going to skip 17 and 18 and go straight into chapter 19. And he says, after these things, you'll have to read, I keep telling you folks, you'll have to read it to see what comes before this. But after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honour and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servant shed by her. Again, they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, amen. Again, hallelujah. You see what's happening here? Salvation and glory and honour and power belong to the Lord our God. This is not a time when the world is on a knife edge. This is going to be a time when God is working out his purposes and bringing his judgment on those who would not believe. But it carries on. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both great and small. This is a time to praise God. And there's a voice of a great multitude in response. Like a rushing waterfall of many thunderings. And what, the, what are they singing? Hallelujah for the Lord our God omnipotent reigns. God is in charge. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Do you ever feel like you're not ready to meet Jesus? By the time you get to this bit in the narrative, you'll be ready. May not be a pleasant process, but you will be ready. But it's a time of praise. So I'm trying to say to you, Lord, this book about the unveiling of the Saviour King is good news. It's not the bad news that it's so often studied as. It's the good news. The King is coming back. And then later in chapter 19, he says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes wars. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Who is this about? 
This is Jesus. This is our King Amen. coming back. And with him, the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. See, this is the unveiling of the Saviour King. This is what it's going to be like when he returns. There's going to be this build-up of trouble. Why? Because he's bringing trouble on the unbelieving kings of the earth. And at the right moment, he will step back centre stage. And he will judge and he will make war. And what do we read? Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. That with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God. And he has on his robe. And on his thigh, a name written. Do you know what that name is? King of kings and lord King of lords. Of kings and lord of lords. Man. This is it. This is when the saviour king is going to be unveiled to an unbelieving world. At the right time. When God has beaten them into subjection. Through their own rebellion, onto the stage will set, step Jesus, the King. And that's the name who will be given. But the story doesn't end there, because we move into chapter 20. And this chapter is fairly well known, but let me bring something out of it. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. I'm in the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up <laughs> and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. God shuts him up, I think, partly so that he doesn't keep popping up and saying to God, I want to challenge this. You see, he's been there all along to do God's will. But now for a thousand years, he's not going to be doing it. And John continues to describe his vision. And he said, I saw thrones and they sat on them. And judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on his forehead. Or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. What have we met here? You see, this is the scene when Jesus sets up his kingdom. And there with him are the souls, the lives of those who were beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and had not worshipped the beast and had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And these people lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the inheritance that we've been thinking about. This is what Jesus wants us to inherit. This living and reigning with him for a thousand years. Now, the rest of the dead do not get raised at this time. 
This is the first resurrection, as Paul calls it. This is the resurrection of the saints who go out to meet him. Those who overcame in this life through faith, who didn't shrink back and denied Christ when the pressure went on. And this is marvellous. And what does it say? Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, of Christ, and shall reign with him for a thousand years. This is the inheritance of the kingdom of God. This is what we're being told to look forward to. Now that may bring something back to you. Those who've endured all seven studies, either live or by catching up on the videos, will have noticed that I said the first mention of the kingdom of God in the scriptures is in Exodus 19 verse 6, where he says to them, basically, if they served him with their whole heart, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And here we are. We're at the fulfillment of that. But it's not just Israel. It's all who believe in him will be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. This is something to look forward to. So, going back to something Philip mentioned earlier to finish with. When we looked at the Gospels, we looked at the words of Jesus when he rebuked the Pharisees and he said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. That's in Luke 17. And that's how it is now. The kingship of God is within us and we are called to live by that kingdom, to live by his reign in our lives. But when our saviour kings come back, comes back, we will be declared to be priests of God and of the King, and we will reign with him for a thousand years on this earth. So yes, now the kingdom is within, but then the kingdom will be expressed through us, coming from the King and ruling on the earth. And that, folks, takes us to the end of Revelation. So welcome back. Time for questions, discussion, challenges. Um, I knew that was a hefty bit, but I felt we had to do it. So is there anything anybody wants to pick up on? A couple of comments. Um, firstly, that word in Revelation 1 shouldn't really be shortly. It means quickly or swiftly, the same word that, the same root that Jesus used at the end of Revelation, I am coming quickly. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why you said there's no mention of the kingdom in Revelation 5, because it's the same word again. Yes. It's 932 in, in Strong's, kingdom of priests and kings. Ah, oh, right. I missed that one. Thank you, Philip. You, know, you actually one. said the word kingdom wasn't in it, but it, 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 it is. It's there. Yeah, yeah. 510, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I overlooked that one for some reason. So there's four, I think. Yeah. Thank you.
I know it's not it's not in the new King James version. Not the word kingdom. No. no it is it made as kings and priests. Yeah. It is in the, this Greek. Right. And it is in the NASB and what have you. And uh, yeah, right. it is in the King James, I think. It's in ours. Yeah, it, yeah. it is in the New American Standard. That's why I missed it. Because because the I was looking in the King James and it doesn't translate it like that. No. I should have searched on the Strong's number. Mm -hmm. yeah. They say the same thing, of course. I mean, yeah. yeah. I know there's a lot to digest there. Exactly, there's a huge amount to digest. <laughs> Yes, it's uh, rather overwhelming when you just you know, take a hit like that. Mm, it is, it's good there. But it was very enjoyable. Yeah. And thank you very much for all your hard work. Yeah. That, that's fine. I, I, when I'm preparing things like this, I learn as well. Well, so. that is the blessing, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I, th I must say that I think, um, Randall, it's a very... Um, good overview and it's very encouraging to get that real sense of the fact that God will show us as we were saying lean not on your own understanding my own experience of this is that when we're talking about when we're praying and when we're getting revelation from God when we are moving in our own understanding he will reveal things to us if we want to know them. If we've gone down the wrong path or we've got the wrong understanding, providing we're walking with the Lord, he reveals it to us. Yeah. And this teaching that you've done tonight has given me a lot of encouragement that as we go through these final days, if we are to be in them ourselves, we will be given what we need exactly at that time. Yeah. which is very encouraging isn't it yeah that this is not given to us to frighten us and terrify us but to prepare us for it and mm. to know that god will provide at the at the time yeah. we, mm -hmm, which is really lovely that's very encouraging mm. For years, I've, I've struggled with Revelation because I've tried, so many people talk about trying to work it all out. And I knew that was wrong, but I didn't know how to handle it. And it's only very recently where it's suddenly begun to live mm. in this fresh way. Mm. That it is there to equip us. Amen. To get to, to be ready and to understand what's happening. Yeah. Because that scripture goes on to say, doesn't it? In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He yeah. will. He says he will, so he will do it. Yeah. And it's that is very much more encouraging. Not to be fearful in any way, but to believe that it's written for our blessing as well. Yeah. Yes, thank you. We're waiting for more questions. <laughs> I am. I, I, I'm not good. To, I'm, I'll stop the recording if people haven't got it. Then you can all talk, you see, and you will have them. But <laughs> I think we've all been overcome by glory, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So well, go. Our own understanding doesn't come into it. It's out the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very encouraging. Yes. I just find it very difficult to understand what it means that we will reign with Christ. You I suppose we can't. Un um, well, the best I get is that 
we haven't we haven't gone into detail in Revelation 20. I've just skipped that. But it seems to me that all the way through Revelation, God is undermining the authorities of this world. And he's bringing them to a place where they collapse. And one of the remarkable things about the fall of Babylon, it comes about because the people who've been benefiting from that system them, turn in on that system and it self-destructs and then that bit I did read that, that we're told that there is this period of time when Satan is bound he doesn't have any authority but he does get it back after this period when Christ has reigned. And I think how I look at that period, have you ever heard people say, well, if there's a God, why doesn't he come out and come down and sort this earth out? Why doesn't he stop people doing all these things? And really as Christians, we say, well, he's being patient to give as many of you time to repent because he's told us one day he is coming back to sort it out Amen. So that will be this period of time when the earth is ruled by Christ and we are working with him in that job we, we see him as having all authority but we will have a role alongside him I can't imagine what it is but we have got a role alongside him but I know it's one thing that Philip struggles with but did you notice it does also to say that after that thousand years, Satan gets one last opportunity to deceive people. Mm. And basically, it appears to me that what have people got to sh demonstrate? They've been saying, if there's a God, why doesn't he sort this all out? And so for a, a period of time, around a thousand years, they get um, they, they get to see what it would be like living under his reign. And it appears people don't die as quickly, a bit yeah. more back at creation. But at the end of that time, they're then given a choice. You've seen what it's like to live under God's authority and all the good things it brings. Now, are you going to do that? Are you going to choose to do that? Or is there wickedness in your heart that when you are tempted again by Satan, you will take his way rather than God's way? Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually God bringing about justice. You see, Jesus has got to come back to rule and judge in righteousness. And if people say, well, we've never seen God reign, we don't know what it'd be like. Yeah. At the end of that thousand years, they will have seen Jesus, yeah. right? Yeah. They know what it would be like, and they will not have that excuse. Yeah. And God will be able to say, the problem hasn't been with me not doing anything. The problem's been in people's hearts. Oh, man. And I don't know what we'll be doing, but there is that period described in Revelation 19, 20, where Jesus is reigning on this earth before this earth is rolled up, as it says in Hebrews, like an old cloak, like it's, and it's thrown away, and the new heaven and earth comes. And during that period, we've got something to do with him, work with him. I don't know what it would be. I, some people say, I want to be this. I, I don't care. I just want to be on the job he has for yeah. me. A doorkeeper. Yeah. Oh, well, well, yeah, maybe, but <laughs> whatever. I'm not, not bothered, you know. It's, no, but we'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, yeah. wouldn't we? Amen. Yeah. Well, my, um, my ambition when I was a teenager was to be a, a tramp or a road sweeper in the Hebrides, so I'll be quite happy to be a road sweeper in 
<laughs> if there are any roads. <laughs> but it, I don't think it really matters. We're just uh, uh, the, the, that incredible scripture says that when he comes back, when we see him, we shall be like him. Amen. Yeah. Now, those that survive into the millennium and then get ruled for a thousand years with a rod of iron until all rule is put under his feet. Yes, I have problems with that, how, how they can revolt at the end if Jesus has been ruled. But that's not the point at the moment. You know, it's uh, yeah. to get to this point. And, um, and the mention of Babylon <laughs> should give you fair warning because when we resume in September, I shall be taking on the, the subject of Babylon from the Old Testament through to the New Testament. So that should give us plenty to get our teeth into to try and figure out exactly what's happening now and uh, the fact that we can be uh, we can be assured that whatever happens now, you know, we have that kingdom, we have that inner kingdom, we have that prayer uh, conduit, as it were, to survive what's going on. And uh, it is finished. I mean, another another scripture is mentioned in Revelation. Jesus at the cross said he saw Satan fall from heaven, you know. So is that future or has that already happened? You know, we don't really know about these things. But uh, we know that we've seen the end of the book and we know who wins. <laughs> Maranatha. 